Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Our dear Master and our dear Savior, Jesus Christ, the one who loved us and gave himself completely for us, we thank you so much because of your great loving kindness towards us for your desire to draw us towards yourself and to be a part of our everyday lives and our families. Uh, dear Lord, we ask that you be here in this church, in this message, dear Lord. We ask that you be the one that transforms us before we can transform others. We ask, dear Lord, that you would uproot and you would change, you would build and you would break down and you would do the things that are necessary for us to be more and more like you day by day. We look unto you, dear Lord, because we have no one else to look to but you. We pray for all the families in the churches, for all the couples, dear Lord, for all the kids, dear Lord. We pray that their union and growth in you would be tremendous. We ask all in precious name, the intercession of St. Mary, all your angels, all your saints, hear us when we, with one voice, call you as your children, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Jesus our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Good morning. So last week, we kicked off the Triumph Project. For those of you who are not at the retreat, the Triumph Project is T-R-I-U-M-P-H, transforming residences into unshakable mighty prayer houses. And I gave you an assignment last week for those of you who attended. How many of you prayed with your spouse this week? Just once was all I asked. Just to pray once with your spouse. And there's no divorce papers that came out of it. Like it was not a bad thing, right? So I actually tried it this week because it's something that we do regularly where we pray together without the kids. And it was awesome. We talked about last week how praying houses is what God wants. When Christ came to earth and he went to the temple, he saw that it was not being used for what it was meant to be. It was his father's house. And he says, my father's house is to be a house of prayer. If you think his father's house was meant to be a house of prayer, what do you think his children's homes he would want them to be? He would want them to be houses of prayers. And so we said the definition of triumph, why we called this mission triumph, we decided to rule out the Kofta project and the lounge project. And if you want to know what that's about, watch last week's talk online on our YouTube station. But the word triumph means it's a victory, it's a success, it's a conquest. That would be a victory for our church if we could have every home be a praying household. We talked about how last week we talked about how last week that there's a battle going on. Uh, if everyone can move forward. From now on, we're only going to put out 10 chairs instead of 200. Because the Sunday school rooms are going to pass it We said how there is a bad awesome. I don't spend much. That there is a battle going on for our households. Whether or not you know it, that there is a battle going on to reign over your house. We talked about how sometimes we ourselves are playing on the wrong side of the battle. Sometimes the things that we're doing as parents, sometimes we're allowing the enemy to be closer. Satan is trying to deceive us or distract us. And we said if there was one thing worth fighting for, based on what the exercise we did in the retreat, if there's one thing that's worth fighting for, I can guarantee you everyone would say it would be our family. We're not interested in just our family looking nice, dressing nice, and having a nice home. But we're willing to fight for our families to be under the guidance of God. Are we willing to reclaim all our homes? 
for him. That would be a triumph. We've said that Satan's greatest trick is not to get you to do bad things. It would be a victory for him, a triumph for him, if he can get good people to do nothing. That's all he wants. He wants you to do nothing. And let him just slowly drag us away. So we said we have to fight. That the great weapon that we will use for our battle will be through prayer and praying as a family. And that would be a triumph. Now I apologize. My PowerPoint is still at home somewhere, and it was awesome. But the verses I would expect you to bring, you need to look them up on the Bibles that you brought today to the meeting, which everyone always brings their Bibles to the Bible study, right? So I'm going to read some of them with you. But I think it would be awesome. Bring your Bibles to this meeting, and you will develop a relationship with your Bible. But in Ephesians chapter 6, St. Paul is talking about doing everything you can to fight against the devil. He says, put on the whole armor of God. And then this is what he says at the end of it. He says, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplications for all the saints. Like, I don't know. He could have said, just make sure you pray. But he said, what? Pray always with all prayers and be watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication. So he tells you the whole armor of God and he says, but I want you to pray as much as you can so you pray always and pray so that you will always pray. Like he says, this is what you need. This is your weapon. So again, I gave you two assignments last week. One of them was to pray with your spouse. The other one was to come up with a mission statement. I said that sometimes this battle that you do for your family, it might begin alone. You may not always get your spouse to pray with you, but that's okay. Your triumph will be even greater when you get your spouse to join you as well. So since we said prayer would be our weapon, there's only one problem with us becoming mighty prayer houses. We just don't know how to pray. I mean, we don't really like to pray. We oftentimes try to avoid praying. So how do we make our homes mighty prayer houses? Well, I'm going to look at an analogy of King Solomon. He spent years building the temple of God. Years. He put all this money into the temple. It's amazing. If you read in 2 Chronicles 6, he says a prayer. It's a great prayer. Solomon is on his knees. His arms are outstretched. And he says, God, if your people come to this house, and let's say we're in a war, and we pray, would you hear them? He says, and if there's no rain, if we come to this house and pray, would you hear them and forgive us our sins? And if we are captives, would you hear our prayer? He's like, if we come and pray, will this be a prayer house? Will you hear our prayers? He was taking the temple of God and said, we want this to be a prayer house. Will you hear it? Then they offered bulls and sacrifices. And then the chapter goes on. Then in chapter 7, something awesome happens. He says, I'm going to read it to you. Chapter 7, verses 12 to 16. Then the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said to him, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. Now I want you to think about your house being like this. He says, when I shut up heaven and there is no rain, or command the locusts to devour the land, or send pestilence among my people, if my people who are called by my name, which is us, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. I'm going to read that verse because that's the key verse. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, will pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Now my eyes will be open, my ears attentive to prayer made in this place. 
For now I have chosen and sanctified this house, that my name may be there forever, and my eyes and my heart will be there perpetually. He says, I've chosen this place, and I promise you, He's chosen your house. He says, I will hear your prayer. My eyes, my heart, I'll be attentive if they do these things when they pray. What were they? Humble themselves, pray and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways. Those were God's criteria when He said, I will hear your prayers. God was allowing these things to happen, the locusts, the no rain, the wars. It was kind of to punish and discipline them. They're in a battle. Their crops are dying. Could you imagine them not praying? You would say they're in such great need. How could they not pray? You would say they were so foolish if all these things God allowed for them to happen and they didn't pray. You'd say, what foolish people? Or you might say, what arrogant people that would not turn to God to pray when they're going through such calamities. I want to ask you, is that us? Could someone be looking from outside and saying, how foolish that these people, how proud they are. They think that they can make it through this world without praying. They think that they can add anything to their life without God. They think that they could get through a day as if they don't need God. Then stop living your life as though there's only time for God after you've gone to work, after you've rested, after you've watched TV, after you've satisfied your desires, and then say, if there's time, I'll talk to God. Because ultimately, what are we doing? We're relying on ourselves to get rid of our problems, to handle our lives. Just like they were going through calamities, we're going through the same thing. And we say how foolish for them not to turn to God. He said He would hear. Why wouldn't we do the same? Why do we think that we're in a war and somehow we can battle against Satan and win on our own? That our kids will somehow be fine under our protection and our guidance more than God. Does that make sense to any of us? You say, Mark, that's foolish. Then how are we behaving? In the Beatitudes, and I'm going to mention this today, what was the very first Beatitude that Christ mentioned? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. He says, for the first thing he starts off, I want people to have this attitude of being poor in spirit. Do you know what that means? The actual meaning of that the concept, what they were familiar with at that time was, I want them to be beggars in the spirit. Could you imagine? At that time, they were already poor, and Christ says, I want you to be beggars in spirit. Why? Why would He want us to be like beggars? You know those people that are beggars, like you've gone to foreign countries, and they will hound you and hound you, and they will not let you go until you give them something, because they have no other hope to survive unless you give them something. You've probably seen that if you've gone to Egypt or Mexico or a foreign country. He says, I want that to be you that you feel like you cannot survive, that you will hound me until you get what you need, and that's what I want. In Psalm 69, which we read in the morning, David says this, and I find it amazing that David says this. He says, Make haste to me, O God, because I am poor and needy. This is David. Now, I don't think he was a king at this time. He might have been running away. But this is King David who has already killed Goliath. 
He's killed a bear. He's killed a lion. He's led armies. He's won mighty battles. He's got people that want to follow him. He knows he's going to be the next king. And he says, I am poor and needy. David, who's taking care of all these people, say, I am poor and needy. That's exactly what God wanted. That's the attitude that God requests. And that's going to require for you to be a beggar. It's going to require a transformation of your mind. Because most of us are not beggars. We're achievers and we're providers. And we're thinking, I can do this. I can take care of my family. How are you going to be able to let go of what you're holding on to? And say, God, I can't win this battle. And I'm going to put it in your hands, in your hands alone. I'm going to do it by praying. I think it's sad, and I don't know how long it'll take for us to realize, and I mean me myself, that I have what I have because God provided. I can do the things I do. I can work the place I work because God provided. And I can't defeat Satan without God's power. And I can't forgive my own sins. And I can't protect my family at all times. And I can't do a lot of things. When will I sense that I am in need? No wonder it's a criteria that God wants us to have that spirit of a beggar. But he gave us the idea of a beggar, but he gave us another example, which I think a lot of us can relate to. When he talked about prayer, he says, I want you to be like children. Now, most of us have children. We've had children. Some of them are still small, and many of them are grown up. But God wants you to understand this concept of a child. He says this in Matthew 6. But you... When you pray, go into your room. And when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And then he says, and then call him our Father. And then ask him for bread and ask him to forgive your sins. Like, like a child would go to his father and say, Dad, I need bread today. Do you remember when your kids asked you to help them do everything? To get them water, to open the door, to be in the water when they swim, and yes, to wipe? Like, the basic things. Some of you are like, yes, so I'm familiar with that. But you know what? You did it willingly because they asked. Sometimes the attitude they asked made you not want to do it, but you did it. Then they got to the stage where they want to do everything on their own. They want to use the knife. They want to cook over boiling water. And they want to cross the street on their own. And what did you say? Why didn't you just ask? I was here. I wanted to help you. Why didn't you just, I'm still your mom, I'm still your dad, and I will always be, I don't care what you can do for yourself, when you're 16 and you can drive and you can get a job, when you grow up and get your own house, when you have your own kids, you're still going to come back and ask me for help, and I will be your mother and your father forever. So no matter what, I want you to always remember, you are my child. And God says, I want you to always remember you go in your room and you cry to your father and I will I will hear you. And that's what he wants. He wants us to humble ourselves. I want you to understand for us not to pray is to be arrogant. To think that we don't need God and that we can do it on our own. It's kind of like turning our backs on God. That's just to get you to begin to pray. And you say, I can't do this, I need to pray. Then when you actually get to the prayer, continue to humble yourself. See, a lot of time our prayers, when we're in the prayer, we're not very humble. We actually give God the orders. But what does God say? What is ideal? For us to just kind of sit at his feet as children and admire and look up and just be in his presence. 
We're supposed to take the lowly spot. He's the Father. A lot of times you don't need to bring Him your accomplishments and say, God, this is what I did. He's Dad. What do you bring Dad? He's got everything. What does He want from you? Just you in His presence. So that takes me to the second part of the command. If you never humble yourselves, you'll never come to pray. If you think you can do it on your own, God says, just humble yourself and realize, I'm God, I'm the Father, just come. The second thing is, He says, pray and seek my face. Seek my face. Is that a funny request? I mean, in the Old Testament, did anyone see God's face without dying? No, they couldn't see God without dying. But He says, seek my face. And I think in English it's a little bit confusing, but in Hebrew when it says seek my face, it means seek my presence. This is a critical part of our prayers that we neglect. I am guilty of this all the time, and I've called it aimless prayer and self-centered prayer. I don't know how many times I go to my room, I pray, I read some prayers, I do some matanyas, I close my prayer book, I felt good about myself, I walk out, and yet I never met God in my prayer. I did the right thing for the wrong reason. How do you go to your boss's office, he sits down, and you go in, you walk, and you look at the window, you look at the things on the wall, and you start talking and start talking, and you just walk around, he's sitting, you never take time to sit in front of him, you never look in front of his face, you never look at him face to face, and then you walk out and say, oh man, thank God I did that. I'm so glad I talked around my boss. Is that what God wants for us to talk around him? Unfortunately, we don't have the goal of meeting Him when we pray. We just say, I have to pray, because I know I need to pray, but I really don't have the intention of seeing God when I do pray. That's not what He wants. He wants there to be a connection to Him, so He says, seek me. Just seek me. So oftentimes I don't seek Him, but when I do seek something, I'm usually not seeking Him. I'm seeking the things that He can give me or do for me. So I have the aimless prayer of not trying to meet Him. And then when I do pray, I have the self-centered prayer where I'm trying to get from Him whatever I want. Dear God, we have a problem with the car. I need help with the car. And i got a problem with my kids. I need to help my kids. And if we can get a better house, that would be great. If you can decorate the house, that would be better. And if we can go on a vacation, that would be awesome. Dear God, every time I need something, I will come and I will ask you. Because you are my sugar daddy. You're my father in heaven. You're my sugar daddy. When I want stuff, I want you to give me what I want. And I'll pray as long as you give me what I want. Isn't that oftentimes the times when we pray the most? When we're in a bad situation, say, God, give me and help me. God is saying, listen, just find me. So here's a verse in James 4, verses 3 to 4. He says, you do not have because you do not ask. He says, but then you ask and you do not receive. Because you're asking amiss, or you're asking wrongly, that you may spend it on your pleasures. James told them, you guys are praying so you can get what you want for your pleasures. So God said, don't just seek what I have, but He wants to be noticed for who He is. So someone wrote this, and I actually had it on a slide. It's a nice quote, so I'll read it to you. God's manifest. Conscious, trusted presence, so God's presence manifests trust, is not our constant experience. Even though He's present with us at all times, His omnipresence is, there are seasons when we become neglectful of God and give Him no thought and do not put trust in Him and we find Him unmanifested. That is, unperceived as great and beautiful and valuable by the eyes of our hearts. He says, seek my presence. Say, isn't God with us at all times? Yes, He's everywhere 
in all places at all times. But He's not present in your consciousness, in your mind, in your heart. You haven't trusted Him at all. He says, seek me. Put away the things that take you away from seeking me. I'm going to go back to reading the Psalms in the first hour. David keeps saying, I seek you. And this is what he says in Psalm 27, verse 4. He says, One thing I have desired of the Lord, and that will I seek. One thing I have desired of the Lord, that will I seek. That I may dwell in the house of the Lord to behold, all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord. One thing I have sought, one thing I seek. That I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in His temple. David says, I just want to sit in your house and see your beauty. In Psalm 63, he says the same exact thing, but in a more desperate way. Oh God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. So I have looked for you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory. Because your loving kindness is better than life. My lips will praise you. I will bless you while I live. I will lift up my hands in your name. My soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness. And my mouth shall praise you with joyful lips. I don't know how many times David wrote a psalm where he says, I am just seeking you. And what was he seeking here? His beauty, his power, his glory. He says, I just want to be in your presence. Some of us are going to say, Mark, that's not my experience. So maybe when we go into prayer, maybe you'll remember this promise of God. In Jeremiah 29, he says a famous verse. This is God speaking. He says, I know the thoughts that I think towards you says the Lord, thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. You will call upon me and go pray to me and I will listen to you. And you will seek me and find me on what? When you search for me with all your heart, I will be found by you. He says, if you seek me with all your heart, you go and you pray, you seek me, he says, I will be found by you. If you're seeking him with your heart. So I realize we don't always have the right words to say when we pray. It could be simple, something as simple as this. God, I realize I don't always think about you. I don't always look for you. There's so many things in my world that I'm looking at instead of you. I really haven't tried. But here I am. I've been told, and I know and I believe that there's greatness, there's glory, there's power, and there's beauty, which I've never seen. I'm just going to sit here, and I'm going to come in and do this every day. I just want to see you. God will show you through His people. He will show you through His Word. He will speak to your heart. He can and He will and He wants to. He's not trying to hide. He says, if you seek me with all your heart, you will be found by me. Sorry, I will be found by you. He's promising you success. If when you pray, you just sit and you admire Him. We have to humble ourselves to get ourselves to pray. But when we pray, it can't be about us all the time. Sometimes it needs to be about Him. Humble ourselves, pray and seek my face. And the third one, which might be the hardest, turn from your wicked ways, says the Lord. Many of us, including myself, want it all. I want my sin. And I want God's blessing, and I want God's grace, and I want God's peace. I want to be allowed to break His commands, because it gives me pleasure. I've justified it in my mind. I've accepted it. I really like it. I want what I want, and I also want what you can give me. So when I pray, just give me both. Let me do my sin, and don't worry, God. I will go to church. I'll give a homeless guy a sandwich, 
and maybe even next year I will volunteer at the kids ministry of retreat as long as I get to have my sin. Now at the time that he spoke to Solomon, they would constantly exchange the one true God for other gods. And that's why he would give them pestilence and no rain and let other people conquer them because they were constantly choosing other gods. And God was a jealous God and he wanted to be the only one. He saw it as hurtful. He saw it as adultery. He didn't want to be exchanged for some lesser God. And I don't blame him. I wouldn't want to be exchanged for some other spouse. I would want my wife's affection to be towards me. You would want the same. Why would we want God to be tolerant of other gods? He wasn't. He wasn't at all. So he says, humble yourself, seek me, and get rid of those other things, and then I will hear your prayer. This requires not to lessen your allegiance to another god, but to turn around completely. So you have to examine what could possibly be the gods in my life. What has captured my heart? What has captured my allegiance? For some of us, it's earthly pleasures. And again, this is something that I'm dealing with myself. We want nice big homes. We want better decorated homes. Is it wrong to have these? No, it's not. But it's wrong to make that your goal. It's wrong to make that your aim. It's wrong for that to be your sole satisfaction. For some of us, we worship the ultimate family vacation. We plan and we research and we compare and we hear stories and we think we will have the best vacation, that this will be the ultimate, we will work extra hours, we will save extra money. We get so excited about that one week vacation. So you could say, man, we went on a great vacation. How many of us, like, that's what we live for. Is, that, is it wrong to have a great family vacation? Actually, I recommend it. Don't have terrible family vacations. They're not great for your family. Have good ones. Have great ones. Enjoy them. But don't idolize them. For many of us, it's our careers. And this is in all honesty. I've seen it in so many of my friends, myself, people around me, we just want that next level, that next paycheck, that next, we want our name written on something big. I want more responsibility, I want to be like the only one of four people in the whole country who does this position for this company. And for some reason, we will kill ourselves, we will spend our time, our thoughts, and our money and that is the definition of worship. How do you know what your gods are? Where you spend your time, where you give your thoughts, and where you spend your money. Ask yourself, is that God? You know idols? Like, we all have idols, right? Like, growing up, like, we didn't have YouTube, but we didn't, but like, you don't want to ever go and look up, like, Michael Jordan. Right? Or you go look up like Lionel Messi, and you just watch YouTube videos of like, like man, this guy's awesome, and then someone puts something on Facebook, and you read it at night, and you're like, oh man, you just read, and you're like, then there's another article about this guy, and there's another one, and you're like, wow, you just sit, and you're like, wow, that's awesome, and you read over and over about a soccer player, or a famous actress, or a great, you know, accomplished person. We will read about them before we close our eyes to bed. We will just read and read and smile and search like, you know, I know I need to get to bed, but there's one more article. When was the last time you said, I need to read one more thing about God? I can't close my eyes until I've found one more amazing thing about God. Like, I want to sleep with my last thought about God. When I wake up in the morning, I want to look on Facebook and I want to see God all over it. Maybe it's not God. Maybe that didn't describe any of our relationship. So who said, who said, who was the 
this requires a soul search. I'm going to read this passage to you one more time in James. It says, Where do wars and fights come from among you? Don't they come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? You lust and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss, that you may spend it on your pleasures. Adulterers and adulteresses, exclamation point. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Whoever wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously? You wonder why we pray for things and we never get them. You feel like prayer is useless. God said there's some conditions for this prayer. Humble ourselves, seek His presence, and turn away from our sins. So I'm going to ask you three questions. I want you to think about these three. Am I not praying because I think I can do this on my own? Am I not praying because I am sure that I can take care of my family, protect them from sin, from every temptation, from every problem, that I can do everything on my own. Am I not praying because I don't think I need God? Number two, do I only seek things and make requests of God to spend on my desires and my pleasures? Or do I ever seek to pray just because of who God is? And number three, is there a sin in my life that I need to confess and turn from, that my prayers be more pleasing to God? Do I think I can do it on my own? Am I seeking God's things or am I seeking God? Is there something that I need to turn away from for God to be so pleased? And the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said to him, I've heard your prayer. I've chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. When I shut up heaven and there is no rain, or command the locusts to devour the land, or send pestilence among my people, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. My eyes will be open, my ears attentive to prayers made in this place. For now I have chosen and sanctified this house, that my name may be there forever, and my eyes and my heart will be there perpetually. Our houses should be prayer houses, mighty prayer houses. Let's pray. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Our Father. Simply our Father. I know you're up there in heaven looking at us, your children, desiring to still be our Father no matter how much we've done, good or bad, no matter how much we've grown, no matter how much we've accomplished, you still want to be our dad. You want to be the one that provides and gives and and you are doing that. We're just not acknowledging it. My dear Lord Jesus Christ, how much have I put so much trust in myself and not you? I live a life that serves me. I want to be happy. I want to be comfortable. I just want everything to be about me. And I'm so sorry. I confess, I know that's not why you created us. I know you want us to be joyful, but you don't want us to be joyful apart from you. I pray, dear Lord, that you enter into our houses in a mighty way. Help us, O oh Lord, to remove the gods, to remove the idols. Help us, O oh Lord, to seek your presence, to just be 
near you. Help us, O Lord, to have strength and have courage to realize that there is beauty, there is power, there is glory. There's nothing but amazingness in you. Why would I trust that anything else is better than you? And that's my mistake. That's my blindness. That's my unwillingness. That's me just doing what I want to do. Please forgive me. I pray, dear Lord, that you give us strength to uproot the things in our houses that are preventing us from being mighty prayer houses. Help us, O oh Lord, to turn our minds, our hearts, our families, our homes. We want to put them all back under your control. I pray, dear Lord, for every husband and wife to have the courage and the humility to stand next to each other, to kneel next to each other before you, and just offer themselves and offer their families to you. I pray that you would help this church, dear Lord, in every church, in every family, every kid, everyone who is called by your name in every place. Dear Lord, we need you so much. The intercession of St. Mary, all your angels, all your saints, hear us we say one voice. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation. Deliver us from the evil one through Christ Jesus our Lord. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. So I have one request of you. I need you to put in your schedule today at least one time that you and your spouse will pray without your kids around. I don't want you to hate prayer when your kids are there. I want you to love each other and God. Promise me next week before you come, you will pray once next to your spouse. That's it. Just once. We'll go from there, but just once. Okay? I know I'm going to be a mean person next week. I'm going to grill you. We'll see you next week.